So I'm with Dino Martins, a very, very good friend and one of Kenya's top uh, ecologists, scientists, runs the Mpala Research Center and uh, is well known for his views on conservation. So Dino, I just wanted to ask you questions that other Kenyans have been answering. What is wildlife? Huh, that's a wonderful question, Paula. So wildlife is for me all species and also all the interactions between species. So I think of wildlife in two terms. In terms of populations, uh, these actual numbers and groups of animals, plants, insects, birds, as well as interactions. And I think often when we think of wildlife, we tend to focus on the issue of populations because we're thinking of endangered species. For example, we know there's only so many rhinos or so many elephants or so many lions left, but we tend to forget about the other side of wildlife, which is interactions. For me, also wildlife is the knowledge and the love and the experiences that we have around animals and around nature and I think as we as much as we care about endangered species one of the things that we we don't understand or care about or recognize we're losing is our knowledge of ecosystems of biodiversity of nature in general uh, so wildlife is is not just the animals and plants but all the other things that happen around them as well that's about the broadest definition of wildlife <laughs> I've heard so far. Although I did have some people telling me that they thought rivers and springs and mountains and uh, oceans were a part of wildlife as well. So that's quite interesting. Um, what do you think consumptive utilization means? That's a difficult question. So consumptive utilization can mean many things to many people. And I think one of the things that is happening in the debate we're having right now is that the gulf between people based on their personal strong feelings is stretching the definition of what we actually are calling consumptive utilization. So if you ask me, am I against or am I for consumptive utilization? It's a very difficult question to answer. I'm for consumptive utilization when it's done sustainably and it's done ethically and it's done morally and it's done in inclusively. For example, Nature Kenya many years ago was involved in setting up a project at the coast, the Kipepeo project, that farms butterflies and it works around the Arabuko Sokoke forest and in the, it's coming up to its 25th anniversary. In those years that it has run, it has put back over a million dollars into local communities. And as a result, Arabuko Sokoke, this incredible forest. Sorry, just get let that big eagle biker go. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so go back. So, so they raise over a million dollars for this community. Community through the sale of butterfly pupae. Okay. So people have eggs that they raise. They feed the caterpillars. They grow the plants. The key thing here is that it is not wild harvesting. Okay. So we need to be very nuanced about these definitions because if you are, make a blanket statement about whether you're for or against it, I feel we'll lose some of the important details about what is really important for Kenyans. So maybe the word consumptive utilization is the problem? It is because what, I think you... most people are thinking about consumptive utilization in terms of mammals and really harvesting, cropping, culling or hunting large mammals, not, not small ones. I'm sure if we start, we were talking about rats tomorrow in Nairobi and we had a way of use, utilizing them, nobody would be against uh, utilizing rats. Depends which rat. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are very cute actually. Yeah. Um, but, but what we're talking about now is the framework ecologically and the reality of the world that we're in. There is very solid data showing that of all the mammals on Earth, 96% of the biomass of mammals are humans and livestock. And only 4% is wildlife. And that includes things like the elephant, the largest land animal, the giraffe, the blue whales in the ocean, the biggest animal that's ever lived. So, so wait, so this means, this idea that we can harvest wild animals like gazelles, impalas, giraffes or whatever to solve food security, do you think that's really a logical or sensible approach given I, those statistics? I would be very skeptical that we can sustain harvesting of wild mammals 
given the current data we have on animal populations. So it would come back to this issue of populations. Now, because of the way we've done conservation, we've done it in isolation, we've done it in you know, in ways that have been very reactive rather than proactive, we've ended up with this situation of we have a certain number of parks and reserves in the country, we also have conservancies. And let me give you an example from Eldoret, which is where I'm from. Eldoret is a farming community. But one of the farms in Eldoret have a protected area within the farm. And on this farm, because there are no predators, there are thousands and thousands of reed buck and orabi and dikers, species that you don't often see is in this many Kruger other... Farm? This is the Kruger farm. Okay. And now that farm is going to... The land use is changing in that area and it might switch from farming to something else. But the fact is, there is this piece of land and it has all this wildlife on it. So how do we now deal with both the needs and realities on the ground as well as our sort of ethical and moral responsibilities as Kenyans to our wildlife and our growth. So that's just one example. And le le let's go to the other extreme. We look at there are some huge areas that are under, that are protected areas in Kenya, um, in northern Kenya, for example. But in reality, there's almost no wildlife left in those areas. So we have, even if we look at our lakes, in Lake Turkana, hippos are almost gone. There are a few hanging out in a couple of the deltas, but pretty much they've disappeared from the lake. Lake Naivasha, because for many different reasons, the hippo population is exploding there and causing a lot of conflict with people. I mean, you saw recently the situation in the news where people were very tragically killed by hippos while trying to take their pictures. So we are looking at wildlife and we're failing to see the dynamics of populations and how we understand and manage them at a country or even a more broad level. Sorry, there's a, we're at a restaurant and uh, there's quite a lot of people here, so we just have to excuse them for a moment. Okay, so let me see if I've got this right. You know? What you're saying is that there is such a, a difference in the levels of populations of animals in different parts of the country, so to have a one solution fix all will not work. Absolutely. Secondly, you're saying that when it comes to harvesting things like butterfly eggs to produce the pupa and actually sell the, the pupa, you can generate significant revenues to support communities which are then will have to protect the forest in order to secure the butterfly eggs. Yeah. So there's a really positive feedback loop there happening in a place like Arabuko Sukute. Yeah. So that kind of thing you'd support. Absolutely. And I think we haven't even begun to scratch the surface because we are so caught up in this debate around, you know, should we be eating and serving wildlife meat in restaurants yeah. or selling it or whatever else, that we're failing to recognize that of all the millions of species out there, we have all these different ways of looking at them and interacting with them and let's bring in technology and innovation and you know cutting edge science and let's think creatively okay so so when we were in the task force meeting something was raised that collecting a pipette of bacteria from let's say like bogoria yeah. is consumptive utilization which is equivalent to shooting an elephant uh, and eating its meat is also consumptive utilization and some people felt that it was kind of a an unfair analogy, they're not, they're not really analogous. That in fact we should have language that is specifically about killing animals for the consumption of their parts like hides and meat. And maybe we can define it to mean ostriches, some reptiles and some mammals versus other forms of utilization which is invertebrates uh, and, and other kind of animals. But that to me is, is still the same challenge which is we have to um, we're only thinking about solutions of consuming them, collecting and consuming. We're not thinking of other, like you said, creative ways that could be non-consumptive or non-destructive. Let's think about that word, non-destructive uses of wildlife. So ecotourism is, is an obvious one which is already being done and everyone says we've reached the limits of e ecotourism. I highly doubt that. I Last night we met some extraordinary people from the National Geographic Explorers Group here in Kenya who are working on fascinating things, whether it's archaeology, traditions and local languages, uh, the connection with some people back to nature. Do you think that there's a realistic possibility of developing non-consumptive or non-destructive uses of wildlife, or, or let me say, preserving wilderness and culture and all of the ecological processes that you mentioned earlier? 
you think it's realistic that we can create a, create products and market products that would generate revenues for communities? Absolutely. Let me speak to the first point you raised, which is about the really a fundamental question on the biology of species. How long is the gestation period of an elephant? 22 months. Yeah, almost two years. Yeah. How long is the gestation period of a bacteria living in Lake Victoria? Probably a few minutes. Yes, they've already reproduced several generations in the time we've been talking. Yeah. So we need to take into account the biology of species as we think about using, managing, appreciating or conserving them. And the fact is, this is a great opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to engage young Kenyans, engage science, engage citizen science, and build a new and creative way of looking at wildlife, mm -hmm. generating useful information, but really, for me, it's about the co-production of knowledge. It's not useful if we just do brilliant science and it's never connected back to the people who are living alongside wildlife. And so one of the questions you raise is, do we, can we really use ecotourism as a way of uh, promoting conservation? Yes, and that is what has happened in many parts of Kenya and has happened from you know, the last however many, many decades. One point that has been constantly brought up is that animal numbers in southern Africa that are managed privately or owned privately have been increasing versus in Kenya where they've been decreasing. And that is correct. Kenya has lost, depending on which ecosystem and place you look, between mm -hmm. 60 to 80 percent of its wildlife. But what Kenya has not lost is that the animals we do have remain in ecosystems, behaving, interacting, breeding, mating, dispersing, serving as seed dispersers, interacting with other species as ecologically functioning species. Southern Africa has a lot of animals, yes, in fenced off sanctuaries where they are managed as single species. They are not ecological species. I think we really need to recognize that, yes, we may have lost a lot of wildlife, but what we do have still, still is, wild. is wild. And it is here through millions of years of evolution. And we can't recreate that. You know, we could, we could fence things off and we can manage them, even with the butterfly farming, the ostriches, the crocodiles, the fish, the tortoises, the chameleons, that's fine. It should be done properly, responsibly, ethically, but it's single species management. Our responsibility is not just to a single species, but to all biodiversity and all its interactions that for me includes interactions with communities. But what if you're just one of these money-minded people who says, well, I can make more money by single species har farming of ostriches and maybe we should just kill off everything else so that the ostriches get all the food and kill off the lions and any other predators. What's the cost in terms of the ecosystem? What's going to happen? Why, why should we care? We should care because without ecosystems that are interacting with many different species, that we could lose everything and we could face collapse of ecosystems, which is happening in parts of Kenya. So scientists don't agree on many things, but one of the things that there is general consensus on is something called the connection between diversity and resilience. And it's a very simple concept that the more interactions you have in a network, be they of species or other entities, the more resilient the system is to disturbance. Give me, give me an example. Practical. So, for example, we're sitting here, and you know, mm -hmm. in Nairobi, and there's all these different plants and stuff going on. Uh, Nairobi is actually this amazing city, which is mm -hmm. incredibly biodiverse. Six hundred species of birds, hundreds of species of butterflies. But the reason that these can all persist, and we can have clean air and clean water coming from the Aberdares, is because we have all these different interacting ecosystems, and they are maintained by having high diversity. The more units you take out, so the more extinctions you have within that system, mm -hmm. the more vulnerable it becomes to collapse. And So, so redundancy is basically what's important. So it's like having six wheels instead of three. Yes. If one wheel blows, you have yeah. five other wheels to go. You do. And that's why you have a spare, you know, we have spare tires on our cars. We have so many, in many human systems, we build in these insurance yeah. and other kinds of networks, education, investing right. in the future. Yeah, yeah. So what I would Cushions. do... Yeah, I, we really need to think about how are we cushioning ourselves against, for example, climate change. Climate change is real and it's happening. In the last 10 years, we've had four major droughts. I have not been to a single conservation meeting where we've discussed climate change. 
we've discussed all these what I think as relatively petty issues that are that are playing out in you know in very mindless ways whereas we seem to be ignoring some of the really pressing issues how are we going to conserve the Aberdare forest if the rainfall patterns change given that this entire city of Nairobi depends on that forest for water those are the kinds of big big picture discussions we should be having and we need to start also confronting some uncomfortable truths we use wildlife and conservation as a sort of surrogate for missing out on the real discussion we should be having on food security and you know that's one of the government's big four items because it really really matters yeah. there is the sad fact that still in Kenya now 50 years after independence that we have children who are going hungry and who are not as hungry but who are malnourished and in northern Kenya in particular we have protein deficiency so I can see the reasoning, let's use wildlife to meet this need for protein. It, so it's the question is, is it going to work? Yeah. And can we really use conservation to say we're going to solve all these other problems? And I remember again the fact we raised earlier that of mammals, 96% of the biomass are humans and livestock. Mm -hmm and 4% of wildlife. So can we just reasonably think if we're going to take 4% to meet the needs of you know, this much larger, no, we're, we're not going to. But how can we do it? And that's where I think we should be creative, we should be engaged, and we should really listen to each other. So I think one thing that the debate has brought out for me, and I've seen both sides of it, the people who are very much pro consumptive util utilization, as well as people who are very against it, I always try to find things that unify people. So in both camps, people care deeply about wildlife. What they differ on is how we should manage and protect it. But there is definitely a deep love for wildlife across all these different sectors of Kenyan society. I think that one of the um, things that I see missing in all the conversations is, yes, we have different ideas. Some people are thinking short term, how can we make lots of money quickly in the next five years because that's our election year, you know, our election cycle. Other people are looking at uh, these long term patterns and processes, like you said, an elephant has a 22 month gestation period, but elephant populations change over probably hundreds of years. There's that issue. And for me, the big missing part of the conversation is risk. So here we are proposing something because we can probably demonstrate financially that there will be some economic return in the five-year time period maybe even more maybe a 50-year time period but we haven't got uh, a real sense of what is what is the risk that we're taking if it goes wrong yeah. in either, either scenario we don't we don't address um, uh, the needs of um, you know communities that live around our protected areas versus we start harvesting animals and it goes out of control and the Chinese come in and do what happened with the donkeys and they just end up plundering um, you know huge populations of zebras and wildebeest and all these other animals. What do you think about that issue of risk and cautionary approach? So another principle that scientists agree on and as I said they don't agree on many things is something we call the precautionary principle and that means that in a situation where we can assess some level of risk, we have some information to make a, a, a decision that is a, probably the most conservative decision, but we tend to do that as scientists because we say, if we perturb the system, if we manipulate it, if we, we mess it up, the friend our friend over, the chicken yes. is coming over, um, yeah. you know, how, how are we going to fix it? And the, the answer is we don't know or we can't fix it. So if you're asking me as a biologist to say, how, how, I think the chicken has a strong opinion about this. Well. You better inter interview him next. Um, can we replace thousands or millions of species? The answer is absolutely not. And, and can we fix ecosystems like we, they're trying to do in Europe now? They're yeah. trying to rewild. It's very, very hard. And it's not, not, not impossible, but it's very, very difficult. And the, the fact I would say again is Kenyans, this, the rooster very, has a very strong opinion on this, <laughs> is that we need to really be thinking outside the box. 
given that Kenya has this gift of nature, nature in its wild state, yes, with all the problems mm. around it, human wildlife conflict, you know, lack of resources, all these other issues going on, but we still have it. And I would say that is something we should really husband and love and cherish because yes, we can manage numbers probably much more efficiently, but what are we doing then? We're managing numbers of kudu or zebra or ostrich or crocodiles or whatever. We're not keeping in ecosystems in a state of integrity that feed back to us, feed back to you know, the water shed, the air we breathe, the soil that we depend on, the chicken. Uh, okay, so now I fully understand when you said wild life is not just the components of the ecosystem it's the interactions between them so when we talk of preserving wildlife we're talking about preserving the entirety of it not just yes. a number of lions and a number of elephants which is the simplistic way that most people might look at it and nature is amazingly strong and resilient uh, we, we, we should be humbled when we look at nature, and I'm always humbled, because if you think about the hundreds of millions of years of evolution that have produced the diversity of life, even just here in Nairobi, versus you know human presence and action on the planet, which has changed it very, very dramatically in a relatively short period of time, we should be looking more broadly at what is our role and our responsibility right. so for me with knowledge and with ownership comes responsibility and I feel like we're not addressing that issue of responsibility yes this might be the most economically advantageous thing to do at this point in time but is it the most responsible thing that's a very big question and often the case the answer is no because we're, we're stealing from future generations if we decide to yes let's let's address this need right now I'm not saying it's not a serious need but if we just address it now and we don't think about what happened in 10 20 or 100 years from now mm -hmm. that then would be a failing of us as, as Kenyans I think we need to really think about yeah. how do we preserve what we have in perpetuity and I, I get it I mean I really see the feelings the strong feeling of communities that they've been given a raw deal because they have if you look at the huge amount of revenue that comes through tourism, you yourself have pointed this out, it's not distributed. That's not just the case with tourism, it's a, sort of the sort of model of economics that we have at the moment. We, we should revisit that. But again, we keep using conservation as this surrogate for all these broader problems and we, we really need to think about those problems because they actually impact conservation as well. And conservation can't be the solution for just for food security or for the lack of economic development or for all the other issues we are facing in society we it's part of it but it's it's a part of it and we must recognize that part of it yeah. I, I think it's very tragic that we actually are looking at conservation and wildlife as a source of economic return and value in terms of cash rather than purely in terms of its value as heritage but I'm gonna have to end it there because this is all the uh, I think 22 minutes okay. but thank you so much Dina. I really really appreciate your time Thanks.